This has been, let me say, a very insightful meta question. What is value? It has been very interesting, very surprising in a lot of uh, different ways. And uh, I would like to say that everyone here learned at least something. <laughs> which, which might seem like a very low bar, but I know that I haven't learned in some situations that would be very easy to learn in, in the past. Not here, I mean, but in the past. So I just wanted to say that we really appreciate everyone, everyone being here today. And we hope that everyone has um, a great enjoyment of the presentation that we're going to have today. Okay. Um, I'm here to do the show and tell, as Nico mentioned. I want to show off a couple of bills from different countries that I've been to. This is intentional, it's about feedback, no worries. But before I share uh, why exactly bills I brought, I want you guys to imagine something with me. I want you to pretend that, these are, that you don't know what a bill is. These are just random pieces of paper with numbers and paint on them. These are just random pieces of paper. And I want you to imagine that I, ask you, that I hand you these bills and I ask you to tell me what they are each worth. How would you rank them? So, I brought one United States dollar. I brought five Guatemalan quetzales, 10 South African rands, 10 Hong Kong dollars, 1,000 Kenyan shillings, and 5,000 Rwanda francs. Looking at it without any context, without knowing what a bill is, I would rank them, for example, I would say it's a piece of paper, it has paint on it, probably not great for drawing, but it doesn't have a little number on the side. So the first I would order them, just looking at the numerical value, would be as follows, by a little number on the corner. But of course, this isn't all that a bill is. A bill has way more than just the little number on the corner. And they can be figured out, a, you can figure out another type of value, the way they can be exchanged by comparing them to a single number. For example, and that changes the order completely. For example, um, when you compare them numerically, this is worth approximately 4.32 quetzales, this is 5, this is 7.85, and so on. So the organization at this point changes quite substantially. And looking at it just from the number on the side, it doesn't make any sense, this organization. It only starts making sense when you look at it from the perspective of how it can be compared to, I use welcome on quetzales for convenience in this case. So that's the second type of value, is the way that it can be exchanged for something else. And yet, uh, the vast majority of these bills are not actually useful here. I couldn't walk up to, say, Gitan and buy a bag of Pringles with a thousand Kenyan shillings, mm -hmm. even though it's more than enough in theory. So the third type of value is how it can be exchanged in the right here and right now. But there's another kind. Because when my parents uh, found these bills in a drawer and they handed them to me, my first thought wasn't of the... Um, when my parents handed me the South African rands, my first thought wasn't, oh wow, this is 4.32 quetzales, I can't buy a Pringles with this. My first thought was of a visit to South Africa when I was a kid. My brother was in boarding school and I went to see, I went to see him and I snuck into his dorm as a surprise and I got to surprise him when he got home. When I see the Hong Kong dollar, I remember one of my favorite vacations I ever went on. I, gorgeous city, if you ever can, you should definitely go. And the Rundum Frank has three uh, stories associated with it. The baskets on the back, remind me of a specific visit that I had where I went to where a certain restaurant that I used to love to go to. The gorillas on the front remind me of my father's old job and the way that I ended up in Rwanda in the first place. And the bill as a whole reminds me of a truly humiliating experience where I completely butchered my French trying to order food. <laughs> so, to summarize, um, there are, how do you measure the value of a bill? There's this numerical value little number on the corner that tells you how much it's worth when compared to other bills of the same denomination. When you start comparing currencies at a less global scale and looking at trade, you can figure out the value by comparing how it can be traded with another denomination. At a local scale with no trade, most of these bills are just paper. And the fourth type of value is uh, the sentimental or personal value that I hold with these bills, the stories they come associated with, and that can be measured with a little number on the corner. Thank you so much. You may be wondering why I look like a host from a TV show from the 80s. <laughs> well, it's because I'm going to be hosting a game. Yeah. Yeah. So, before I begin, I need three volunteers. <laughs> One, two, three, it was the first three ones, so please come here.
This game is, cost, is called The Cost of Living. We have our three players, and I am going to show you what the three types of value I think that exist throughout this game. So first, let me explain a bit. This game is uh, like, uh, so it's like a board game, but we're gonna have three characters. Our first character is going to be Nico, the second one, a, your name, Thomas, <laughs> and the third one, Sochi. <laughs> The characters in the game are called Knight Menger, which is going to be uh, Nico. Yay. Knight Menger is a knight who defends uh, the ability for people's, that, for people's needs to get satisfied. But only real needs, not imaginary needs. The second character, which is going to be Thomas, is called Wizard Marks. Yeah. Wizard Marks was the first one to discover a method to embody people's soul into an object through human labor, scary. And the third one is called Jester Saravia. Jester Saravia is a guy who appeared in last minute to tell us about a just, to how to obtain a just price. But we don't really know much about him, so there is no, <laughs> there is no joke. So they are going to roll the dice, uh, Nico, este sos tú, Thomas, tú sos este, y este sos tú, Sochi. You guys are going to roll the dice and go through the different challenges. You guys start with three cards. The three cards represent an element each, like a, a different element that is going to help you throughout the journey. So, would you like to start? I would love to. Click the button? Yeah, just click on it. Oh, so you're gonna move five. One, two, three, five. Now you go, Thomas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you go. Okay, what? Just click the dice. Okay. Sorry. What happened before? Yes. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué pasó? <laughs> Nothing happened. Uh. <laughs> now you go, Sochi. <laughs> okay, six again. This is so rigged. <laughs> Against me. Yeah. Now I'm going to be rolling the dice for the rest of your turns, but you may sit. <laughs> but you are going to represent the characters. Okay. So okay. this is okay. Nico's turn. He got two. Which one were you? This one. Now, Sochi. Thomas. Okay, but in order to pass the dragon, he needs to overcome a challenge. This dragon is called Adam Smith. <laughs> and this dragon is going to exterminate you unless that you decide to exchange something with him in a free market. So, you need to exchange something of value with him. So, you need to pick something from one of your cards. Uh, yeah. The middle one. Okay. Yeah, this has social value, so you may exchange it. Therefore, the dragon ain't going to kill you. So, you're going to move the rest of your spots. We're running out of time, so I don't think we're going to be able to play the rest of the game, but I'm going to explain it for you in order for you to understand the rest of the, the values. There are three challenges throughout the story of the game. The first one is the dragon. The dragon is called Adam Smith, as I explained you, uh, and he can only exchange something in a free market if it has value for the dragon and for you. That is social value, which can be exchangeable. It affects it is affected with uh, if human labor was used in the process of its creation, but the most important part is if someone uh, needs it or thinks that it needs it, whether that be a real need or an imaginary need, which is a mix of Marx and Menger's ideas. Then we have the forest in which things are forgotten. This forest 
is where certain values or certain things become less valuable due to ignorance. And this value in the game, if you get there and it happens to turn out that you don't have your innate value, which in this case is a pineapple, you starve to death because you have no food. This happens because there are certain values that we tend to forget due to the way in which value works nowadays, but there are certain things that have value innately since they exist because they help us survive. That is innate value. Whatever that helps you to elongate your life in a well matter. And lastly, we have the uh, last challenge, which is a princess. The three characters are trying to convince a, convince a princess to fall in love with them, but they can only fall in love with them. She can only fall in love with them if they have what it's their effective value. In the story, the princess used to live in a castle. However, she was kicked out without being able to take any of her stuff. So the three characters took some of those things in order to give, to give them to, to her, and she would uh, fall in love with them if they were able to keep them throughout the entire journey. Because effective value are uh, due to imaginary goods that are not really real, but that we think we need them because they help, they allow us to survive in a sense of our uh, personality, of our identity, which is like a similarity to the innate value, but in a new way. It's like a second body that we have created for ourselves. So we have these three types of value. Social value, which is exchangeable, innate value, which helps us to survive, to maintain the body, and the last one, which is uh, affective value, which is in regard to emotions, and is absolutely subjective. Um, so yeah, those are the three types of value. However, the three types of value relate all of them to innate value because they are all trying to help us to survive. That's why I called it the cost of living because it's either the cost that it has for your individuality to exist, for your identity to exist, or whether that be for your body, which would be the innate, or the social value, which gives you access for things that help you maintain your life. Thank you. Before anything, I would like to read you a very interesting news that I heard very recently. I think you guys are going to like it, so listen to this very carefully. A team of scientists has announced they have achieved a complete recombination of the chromosomes of an extinct species, a genetic engineering breakthrough that could pave the way for the design and creation of species that do not exist in nature. The specimen is the world's first animal with fully reprogrammed genes, and the scientist said, referring to a process where researchers break chromosomes into various segments and put them back together in different combinations to create a new package of genes. That is what I call progress, am I right? That is what I call what the modern, what the modern world is. Advances in tech and science. Progress is more, is better. Progress is profit. Progress is benefit. Progress is natural. Development is essential for all living species. We are in constant movement. Progress is innovation. But listen, innovation is also destruction. Something needs to die for a new thing to be able to bo be born again. Just like a phoenix that doesn't look back, it only looks forward. And it's, and it's stuck in this constant cycle of fire and death. Con condemned forever. I'll keep reading the news. This research is a breakthrough in bioengineering technology, helping to understand the molecular mechanism behind growth and development, reprodu reproductive evolution, and even the creation of a species. Progress, more, better. There's a quote that I've been thinking about a lot. You guys have heard me say it a million times. If there's equality, there's no prosperity. Equality sounds kind of important, no? Sounds like the thing that we've been farting, fighting for for a very, very, very long time, no? And what about prosperity? Prosperity is success, is profit, is growth, is progress. 
But why should we choose between them? Sounds awful, no? To put one above the other. But isn't this how our, our minds work? Aren't we constantly choosing between this and between that? Always choosing with what we want. But what is to want? Higher, to strive, to move, but based on what? On what we value. The action of value is like a game of tug war, a game of balance, because it is very limited. When we make a decision, we always consider of what we're going to lose. That's what you may call opportunity cost. And whatever the, out the outcome is, it says a lot about us. It's part of our identity. Ask the market. Whatever the market provides, it's what we demand. The, product, the products that are now in circulation are, the pro are what speak about us. Social media, junk food, Hallmark movies, vapes, drugs, dinosaurs. They speak about us because we have chosen them. Because that's kind of how the mind works, you know? Apparatus of classification and everything. So if there's equality, there's no prosperity. We are constantly forced to make choices. And in every action, there's a reflection of the things we value. Even our interactions with each other. Emotional, professional, social. It's always a give and get back dynamic. A dynamic of profit. But how cruel of you to define our behavior as transactional. Is there really nothing more? Are we really condemned to this cycle of death and fire just like the phoenix is? Are we really condemned to go up this hill forever and ever, a hill that we will never see the top of? Are we condemned to the pursuit of progress that we love so much, of growth, of more, of better? One must imagine Sisyphus happy, but I don't know about that. If there is equality, there is no prosperity. It's a matter of choice, and the modern mind has chosen. We have chosen what we don't want to lose, and that is progress, prosperity. We want more. We want better. We want the progress. Go ask the market. Truth is, the search for these unattainable goals leads to a very grim situation, right? And I think it's time to ask if this is really what we will value over other things. I'm not against progress or modernity or innovation, discovery, technology. I'm not against it. I think it's important. But I'm just worried that maybe we just see it as something that is limited. I'm worried that this, about what this pursuit really says about us. Because this, yes, it's a movie that we all enjoy. But most of this presentation, I have based it in a real thing that happened recently. We are not too far away from this, progress-wise. And as of right now, the answer of who we are and what this says about us is not one that I'm willing to accept. And because of that, because of that fact, I believe that we can do better than that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, today I'm going to talk about value, of course, and art. What about art was a big question throughout this meta question. So first I'll be defining what a commodity is. A commodity is a product on, or an object that will satisfy a need or a want. Um, why do we value? I think that as humans be, human beings, well, we have rationality, so we know what specific thing will satisfy that need or want. And specifically, because of rationality, we tend to want more, even if it's not something necessary to survive. These commodities have a hierarchy, as you can see here, um, from basic, medium, basic, medium, and luxury. Um, the basic Commodities are survival ones, just food, housing, whatever helps us to sustain life, no more, no less. Uh, then we have medium that we can start um, uh, introducing wants. For example, choice of food. We can choose to purchase a car to facilitate movement from one place to another. And um, these wants um, come with necessities as well. 
because if we want to buy a car, we need to maintain it in order to function. And lastly, luxury. Um, those are totally not uh, necessary, but um, you have to have these two covered in order to acquire luxury products. And if you want them for enjoyment, you should get them. Now, what about art? So art is not something that will make us survive. So it's not a basic need. And depending on what type of piece you're thinking about getting, it could be a medium commodity. But if we talk about like the Starry Night, for example, it, it would be a luxury. But uh, art is not a commodity as the ones I was describing before. Art, we don't purchase art for a, for a specific task for it to fulfill. Art is meant to reflect human life, humanity, and its purpose is to be contemplated. So now the process making. So I'm going to call like non-art common commodities and art art. <laughs> uh, for common commodities, uh, Menger says that uh, the production or the human labor is not as, Im as important um, as long as it fulfills its purpose, it fulfills the necessity or the want, it is valuable. And I agree with that. Um, I think it should be like industrialized for it to have bigger production and more income, profit for more production. But if we apply that theory to art, it would lose its complete value. Um, art's com uh, essence is human, is humanness. Um, to reflect that human essence. And Marx, on the other hand, he says that what gives value to, to commodities um, is human labor. And if we apply that theory to common goods, uh, commodities, nothing would have value because if it's an industrialized, it wouldn't have value. But I think it, it, they have value because they satisfy the need or want. And also for art, its uniqueness um, is a very important thing. Um, even if an artist decides to make two times the same paintings, it, it, it will never look the same. For example, um, Munch, he, the, he's the artist that made the, the screen. Uh, he made it six times throughout 40 years the same painting about his sister passing away. And as you can see, none of them look the same. They change from colors, tones, and even forms, lightings. Um, so uniqueness. And those paintings, they all show humanity. So human labor cannot be separated from art. Now, why is art so valued in museums? I would say that historic context is something really important here. For example, Van Gogh, he was a pioneer in the post-impressionism movement. Um, so we museums are keeping alive the movement. They are keeping human innovation uh, alive for all of us. And many times those pieces in museums have an estimated price to them. But at the same, at the same time, they're not for sale. And that shows how much the piece is way more worth than a hundred million dollars. So we will pay for something if we value the object more than the money that it's asked for in exchange because it's going to satisfy our needs. And each of us have different needs and wants and preferences. So that's why there is differences in the market and in sales. And for me, art is really important. So because of the reasons I explained before, uh, it makes total sense that art is expensive. Uh, and to conclude my MP Cafe, um, value is something that we care about because it's going to give us something that we want and that we are willing to pay. And yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk to you about what is value to me. 
I struggled a lot with this question at first because I wasn't able to reconcile the idea of value and economy because economy didn't feel personal enough to me and value did because I'm a fragile little snowflake and everything is personal. But then I decided to start a little experiment throughout the meta question in which I acted as if everything I did, every interaction I had and everything I consumed wasn't existed within an, an economy of a sort and had a react, uh, an effect on something else. And I wanted to observe whether that effect was good. But then I started to consider what sort of economy did I want that to be. And being the type of person that I am, the first thing that came to mind was, of course, a circular economy. And so I wanted to begin studying what circular economies were already present in my life, which is why I brought you this, which is a part of my compost from home, which just looking at it, you can already think of what, of why it could model a circular economy. You get fertilizer from it for your plants, which is what I mainly use it for. But then I also started considering something that occurred a few years ago with my compost, which is I bought a pumpkin for, for jack-o'-lanterns for October. And after that, I put the seeds into the compost and I got plants started sprouting. And I've been doing that for a few years now. And I grow my own pumpkins at home. And then the cycle starts again. But thinking more about circular economy, I asked Jose to tell me what the authors that we were reading thought about it. And he told me that the Austrian School of Economics doesn't like this, this um, model because they deem it too perfect. And it works only in theory. And that can be seen in my compost as well. As this happened to me, I was observing part of my uh, little piece of food from my compost under a microscope last year with the expectation that it was mold. But that is not mold, that is lichen, and which is a symbiosis of fungus and algae. That's why you, if I play the video, you will see something moving around, which is a rotifer. But then the lab assistant told me, Nina, that's, that's not good. Like, that could give you a pulmonary disease. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even have two, two lungs. I can't risk that. So then I took the time to evaluate what was wrong. Why was I getting lichen instead of mold? And I came to the conclusion that I was keeping my compost bin in the laundry room and at my home. And the phosphorus in laundry detergent is actually a catalyst for, for photosynthesis in, in a lot of algae, like cyanobacteria in the lake of Atitlan, which is why you get it a lot, because people wash their, their clothes there. And I was able to fix that because I took the time the time to perfect that cycle, which is why I, I think that the circular economy could work if you just gave it the time, which brings me back to this, this quote by Menger that I, that's what most impacted, impacted me in all our readings and is what made me think of ecology in the first place. We can conclude that economizing men generally endeavor to ensure the satisfaction of needs of the immediate future first, and that only once this has been done do they attempt to ensure the satisfaction of needs of more distant periods in accordance with their remoteness in time. He gives value to time, which of course we have to take in order to perfect something, and to reject that idea entirely, even in a circular economy, which sometimes may seem unattainable, just doesn't hold value to me. And as I was thinking also about how to apply this into my life, I thought, why should we, 
why should only producers take this model into account? And so I have been adopting a circular economy as a consumer as well with my compost and the sourdough starter and many things within my life. And I would like to close my presentation with a quote by one of my personal heroes, Dr. Jane Goodall. What you do makes a difference. You need to decide what sort of difference you want to make. Thank you. So I wanted to talk about something that doesn't have exchange value, something that I wouldn't exchange for anything else in the world, and that is dreams. But most importantly, it is a dream or a kind of dream called a love trip. This is a painting of Endymion and the goddess of the moon, Selene. And the story behind these two is that Selene loved uh, Endymion so much that she wished to put him into an eternal sleep. And so every time the moon would come out, she'd go visit Endymion. And I feel like this is the, the start of the love trip, or this is a love trip. Because I, I don't doubt that Endymion dreamed before this, but the difference is that this is a love trip. And the first valuable thing of a love trip is the relief of not existing for a night, which is basically being whisked away into another world, into a more like personal world where everything is more romantic. So yeah, you're now being whisked away into a better world, a world where even sadness seems better in this world because of the romanticism and the dreaminess behind it because it's a dream. <laughs> and, but in the end, this dream has to end. This love trip has to end. But it doesn't end when you wake up. It's not as simple as that. You may wake up and you may, I think we've all had those, those dreams where we wake up and all we want to do is just go back into that dream. Not exactly go back to sleep, but go back into the dream we were. And I, I, I could never do it. I don't know if you guys could, but I, I could never. But this is not when the dream ends. I mean, this is not when the love trip ends. The love trip ends when it's breaking up with you. When you wake up and you realize that you're not in that world anymore and you're in this real world where you have all these things you have to worry about, um, all, these, all, all these responsibilities that somehow just vanished in, in the dream world. But in the end, the rain clears the month, which means you have to get over the, the love trip. I mean, you have to. You can't live in a dream world your whole life. And I feel like even though the love trip ends, you get a lot of value from it. You get inspiration. You get dreams that stick with you for years and years. I mean, I, I remember dreams from when I was like five years old, and they're still here with me. And I value them. I, I couldn't compare their value to, to anything else in this world. And um, yeah, the end. And that's a dog. Uh, I'm Thomas Fairhurst, and I'm here to talk to you about the value of coffee. Why do we love coffee? Well, everybody loves coffee. It's delicious, it smells great, it warms you up, it keeps you awake. Around the whole world, coffee is probably one of the most valuable commodities there can be, to the point where Pablito gets recognized <laughs> in Japan just, <laughs> just for being Guatemalan and people there knowing that coffee equals Guatemala. Or we're here in the MP Cafe. So everybody loves coffee. A lot of time and effort goes into making coffee. A uh, whole process of planting, harvesting, selecting by altitude and grain density, uh, pulping and fermenting, then um, drying the beans, storing them for months or even years, 
milling, which is like skinning them. And finally, distributing, roasting, uh, grinding, brewing, and drinking to the point where we're here. <laughs> now, why would we value a Starbucks coffee more than a Gitan coffee or an IKP coffee? Well, that is, is it's an interesting question because the process is probably similar. In fact, it's probably the same, coming from the same farms, the same um, roasting company, just probably the same thing. So then why is Starbucks coffee more valued than either of these coffees to the price to the point where it's twice the price? Well, that's because Starbucks coffee is being backed by Starbucks, the company. Uh, thousands of franchises throughout the world and thousands of employees working for them, um, creating one of the, the largest workforces in the world with wealth of experience to bring you the best possible cup that there can be. How do we know that? Do we know that there is actually a whole work of experience of, of labor going into this coffee that makes it the best coffee in the world? Or do we not know that if we go to Cayada and get a Starbucks coffee, that's the last Starbucks there is. Well, for you see, that, um, um, that is when the problem of fiat coffee comes in. No, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, fiat coffee. Yes. So we trust Starbucks more than we trust iCafe or Gitan just for the marketing, for the experience, for the history, for whatever. And how fiat coffee works is that the value of fiat coffee is derived from a relationship between supply and demand and the stability of the issuing company, rather than the worth of taste backing it. Most modern coffees are fiat coffees. The value of the coffee is based solely on the, on the trust for the company and the process that makes it get there. I can't really taste the difference between either of these coffees. So it's not being backed by anything, just a trust in the company. So if, the no if to the normal everyday consumer, the taste is indistinguishable, does it matter? Uh, does it matter if the industry power of Starbucks, Gitan, or iCafe is different if the end product will turn out pretty much the same? Well, that's the problem with fiat coffee. The value of coffee is increased or decreased depending on the name that, <laughs> that it has on the cup. And I put Disney as the lower value because I asked and nobody likes Disney. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think that Starbucks coffee is of a higher quality, then you have been bean boozled. Pun definitely intended. Starbucks is evil. So because one of the ways of grading coffee, the lowest quality coffee is washed, which is the method used by Brazil. And that's why when you hear Brazilian coffee is not really that high in price. And the highest is Genuine Antigua. If you go to Starbucks in the States, you can get a bag of Genuine Antigua coffee, which will be of high quality and will be very expensive for it. Is it actually a higher quality? Will it taste different? Because that would be the case if it was true. They are legally obliged to only put in 20% uh, Genuine Antigua coffee in the total weight of the bag. And sure enough, that is what they do. So yeah, the value of coffee is definitely a social construct built by lies, deception, fake ideals, and misplaced or irrational trust. <laughs> How can you trust that the coffee that you're buying is actually of high quality or is backed by the taste that you think? Well, why do we value it? Why should we value it? Just because we love it. So thank you for your valuable time. Uh, lastly, uh, as a final contribution to our MP Cafe, I will be presenting an examination into why love is valuable. An economist's guide to the perfect relationship. Imagine that you're an economist and that you've decided to just leave economy for a couple of days and you've decided to get into some kind of social relationship. It can be a romantic relationship, a friendship, it can be a professional relationship. I don't know, whatever you want. The thing is, you don't quite really know exactly how to do that, nor why you would do that, because a relationship, what value does it have, right? Mm -hmm. 
Thankfully, I'm here to help you out with that. So we're going to start off with our main questions that we're going to try to answer so that we can get you into this relationship. Firstly, does love have value? Secondly, if love does have value, is it an intrinsic value? And thirdly, can we explain the value of love through economic terms? Something important to keep in mind about uh, love is the concept of mutual beneficence. Any type of social relationship is um, originally based on a basic trade relationship that is just expanded a little bit further uh, depending on how close these two people are. Something that is also important to remember is that even though humans in our nature are self-interested, it doesn't mean that by us doing our own self-interested um, ideas and actions that it will not benefit other people. Given the two facts that any relationship is a type of trade relationship and the fact that trade only happens when both parties benefit from said trade, we can affirm that a relationship necessarily requires for there to be mutual beneficence and for both people to get more back from the relationship than what they put in. So therefore, it is inherently valuable. Second, the value of labor. So something important to keep in mind is that Marx says that human labor is the basis of all types of value. Um, so even things that have use value, things that we can use but didn't have labor put into them, can still not be valuable or still not have value. Relationships, as everyone should know, require work and effort to keep them together when uh, people have disagreements, when there is any type of issue that needs to be resolved, there needs to be work and therefore labor. So given that a relationship requires hard work and given that the origin of value is that labor, we can see that a relationship requires labor and as such is also inherently valuable from a Marxist point of view. So next up, the School of Salamanca, specifically Luis Arabia, mentions that all true value actually comes from the um, comparison between what is abundant and what is uh, lacking or scarce. And uh, for example, labor and uh, the actual cost of things doesn't really come into um, effect here. So true love uh, is actually very, very hard to find. A lot of people here will know that feeling of having a friendship, a romantic relationship uh, break, and it really hurts and it happens time and time again. But that's just something that happens since true love is so scarce. It's really, really rare. However, that is important because of the fact that given that a relationship is based on true and wavering love is difficult to find. And given that the scarcity gives an object more value, we can say that since it is rare and scarce, it has inherent value. So some final thoughts here are that given the previous three arguments, we can affirm that the, the mutual beneficence, the human labor and the scarcity give it an inherent value. So accept. Oh no, I've been teaching you the wrong thing. Oh no, it's just that you see Vernon Smith in this quote, he is basically saying that human beings will always be subconsciously aware of the concept of reciprocity. Basically, getting back what you also put in, but from another person, if you will. And it's very similar to the concept of the mutual beneficence. It's just that if the reciprocity is not present, then a relationship is going to fail. This relationship is toxic. <laughs> So given that, uh, we can actually extrapolate a little bit from it um, into seeing that if we are solely focused on that reciprocity and we are solely focused on making sure that we're getting back what we put in, then that relationship is no longer genuine. 
So the one problem here, all of the previous arguments that I gave you, all of them giving a relationship inherent value are wrong. They are all based on reciprocity. So if you're aware of it, it doesn't matter anymore. How do we fix this? I know <laughs> the perfect person. And that is Menger with the subjectivity of value. Menger assures us that it's OK. Just as long as you want something to be valuable and you believe it to be valuable in your heart of hearts, then it can have value that is different from everything else that is put into it together. It can be less than it, which, yeah, that is also a sign that the relationship is going to fail. But if you want it to be worth so much more than what you've put into it, than what exists within it, it can be. So some final thoughts. This time, actually. <laughs> These are the previous arguments that I had given you. We have learned that they're actually all wrong, that they don't work out logically. So love is a valuable thing, and it is as valuable as you truly want it to be. Thank you. Wonderful. So um, since I am the last person to go by, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who has come here for coming to the MP Cafe. It has been a, a bunch of very interesting presentations, a lot of things to think about. And uh, I'm very excited to see where the next MP Cafe goes. Thank you. Thank you.